Hello and welcome to this online book launch. I'm Moira Reed, Marketing Coordinator. I'm delighted to be joined by Helen Boyce, author of A Field Guide to Harlequins and Other Common Ladybirds of Britain and Ireland. Helen has a lifetime of experience photographing and studying British wildlife and has worked with wildlife groups and conservation organisations, as well as giving lectures and leading educational walks. I'm now going to hand over to Helen, who will speak to us about Harlequins and her forthcoming book for the next 50 minutes or so, and then I'll come back to ask some questions. Thank you, Moira. Hello and welcome. I'm very excited to be launching my new book, and I'd love to tell you a bit about it. Before I do that, first I thought I'd share with you about the lady, Harlequin ladybird and then why I became so interested in ladybirds. The Harlequin ladybird, Harmonia axiridis, was introduced by farmers into North America from Asia in the 1980s as a form of biological pest control to eat the aphids and other insects feeding on farmers' crops, and it was very effective. However, it is now the most common ladybird in North America. It is an example of a pest control species that has itself become a pest. Over the following 20 years, it was introduced to European countries, again as a biological form of pest control. It was only a question of time before it arrived on our shores, and it arrived in Britain in 2004. It spread incredibly rapidly. Famously, the grey squirrel took 100 years to spread over most of Britain. The Harlequin ladybird spread over Britain in just 10 years. So we're not sure how it arrived. It could have arrived on the back of um, transport and back of lorries. It could have come in with trees and plants. However, I do also have one personal story, which I want to share with you. And that is that I was speaking to a friend of mine's father he told me that in 2003, he went to stay with his son in Canada. And whilst he was there, he was saying that these ladybirds were everywhere. They got into his clothes, they got into his shaving cream. They were a real pest, they were everywhere. And when he came back, he undid his suitcase and to his absolute amazement, they'd even got into his suitcase. So I asked him what he did with them. And he said, he opened the window and he let them out. So we don't really know how they arrived, but unfortunately they out-eat, they outbreed, and they outlive the British native ladybirds. And they are the reason why the two stop spot numbers have really crashed. If you have ladybirds coming into your homes in autumn, the chances are they are harlequin ladybirds. There might be a few other ladybirds in there, Predominantly, they will be harlequins. There are 47 species of ladybird in this country, and 21 of them are what's known as inconspicuous ladybirds, and they are very small, indistinct, slightly hairy, and wouldn't really be recognised as ladybirds. There are 26 species of conspicuous ladybirds, and these are larger with bolder markings and bright coloureds. It's these 26 species of conspicuous ladybirds, including the harlequin ladybird, that I describe in the book. How and why did I get so interested in them? Well, one summer, a while back, I kept coming across these black and orange reptile-like larvae. And I discovered that they were the larvae of the newly arrived harlequin ladybird and that they could be threatening the existence of the natives in my garden, so I decided to find out more. One thing led to another, and before long, I became totally obsessed. I started bringing them into the house to study. These, for example, if you can just make out the little orange blobs on the leaf, these little orange blobs are the pupa of the um, harlequin ladybird. And these pupa, I wanted to study them as they emerged as an adult from their pupal case. And it only takes probably 10 to 12 minutes for them to, from start to finish, to emerge. So despite setting my kitchen timer every 10 minutes through the entire day, I still missed loads of them. And they can, they can come out during the day or during the night, but I managed to catch some of them and study them. So it was fine. Then I started breeding them. 
And before long, this is what my dining room tables looked like. I was fascinated by every stage of their development and I learned so much. And I have now studied, documented and photographed well over 10,000 ladybirds and I still find them absolutely captivating. The yellow 22 spot ladybirds on the top left hand corner, they are on feeding on powdery mildew. That's what they eat, they're non-predatory. So they eat just the mildew, that's their food. And it's always worth in the summer, if you're out and about and you see some of the large hogweed leaves and you see that they're white because of this powdery mildew, it's always worth having a closer look and carefully lifting them and looking underneath to see if you can spot any of these beautiful little ladybirds. They're only about three to four millimeters long, but they are really charming. The kidney spot ladybird on the right, that is actually sitting on a spindle branch and you can just make out the scale insects and that's what they feed on. Briny ladybirds are lovely. They are one of our slightly larger ladybirds. They're five to seven millimeters long um, and they have a slightly matte appearance as you can see due to the light covering of short downy hairs. As well as, how I, as well as how to identify ladybirds, the book also covers every aspect of the ladybird life cycle. On the left are these eggs of the 14 spot ladybird, and on the right, they're the eggs of the harlequin ladybird. In order to give the larvae the best possible chance of survival, the eggs are laid near the food source of the larvae, so that as soon as the larvae emerge, they'll be able to eat. A larvae, when it emerges, it only really has a day to a day and a half to find its first food. And if it doesn't find food within that time, then it's not going to survive. The book also talks about larvae and various stages and the various stages that they go through before becoming pupa. Interestingly, the yellow eggs shown here on the left, those are the infertile eggs. So when the um, larvae emerge from the eggs, they will eat those infertile eggs, which will instantly give them something to eat, which will increase their chances of survival. As well as individual photographs of many species of ladybird larva, in the book there's also a section showing photographs of the larvae of all 26 species. On the left, you can see the briny ladybird larva actually emerging from its skin. The book goes into great detail about how to identify the harlequin larva. And there's a section on pupae, in particular, the harlequin pupa and how to identify it. There are time sequence photos in the book of both the larvae and pupae emerging. Most ladybirds, when they first emerge, are a, a really lovely translucent yellow. Uh, their spots take a few hours to come through and they don't get their full deep colours for several hours or more. The photograph on top shows the newly emerged adult and the photograph below looks, shows how it looks once its colours have come through. The book explains how ladybirds overwinter often hunkering down and seeking shelter in old thistle heads, curled up leaves, leaf litter, or just cracks and crevices in the bark. If the winter is an especially cold one, then they might seek better protection and go even deeper under the leaf litter. These two harlequins are demonstrating how indiscriminate harlequins are in what they eat. Of the 26 conspicuous ladybirds found in Britain, 21 are predatory, and for the vast majority of these, aphids are the main food source. The remaining five species are non-predatory and feed on things like mildew or plants. However, the harlequin has a voracious appetite and it is a very capable and proficient hunter. Unlike most other British ladybirds, 
uh, which have quite restrictive diets, harlequins will readily eat a wide variety of foods, including aphids, um, soft fruits, uh, pollen, as well as other insects, including other ladybirds. What the book really sets out to do is to help people learn how to identify each and every one of the 26 species of conspicuous ladybirds, but especially the notoriously difficult to identify harlequin. In this country, the harlequin comes in three different color forms. By far the most common is this red, orange or yellowy color form, Harmonia axiridis succinia. The harlequin only ever has a maximum of 19 black spots and individuals can have anything from no spots at all to all 19 spots. As you can see here, on some, the spots can almost be non-existent. On others, they can just, there can just be a few spots. Whereas on others, then all of the spots can be showing and you can have 19 spots. And sometimes they can be really quite bold and they can merge together. And sometimes this creates quite distinct patterns. I have created an identification key for the book to help you determine whether or not a ladybird is a harlequin. And in the book, I go over each identification tool in great detail with accompanying photographs. However, the easiest way of telling whether a red or yellow ladybird is a harlequin is to look and see if you can see these two shoulder spots. They're the two spots that you can see here, close together, near the front, running parallel with the edge of the wing cases. And they really are a useful identification tool. This red orange color form is the most common form found of, of the harlequin found in this country. And the shoulder spots really are the first thing to look for if you come across a, a red ladybird and you want to know if it's a harlequin. Fascinatingly, in the autumn, once the temperature has dropped, the red orange harlequins often emerge looking very dark, almost black, with their black spots I don't know, spread or merged and ill-defined. But if you look carefully, you can still see the, the two shoulder spots. There are two black color forms, um, Harmonia axiridis conspicua, which has two red or orange color spots, and Harmonia axiridis spectabilis, which has four red or orange color spots. And the really easiest way to identify them, again, the, the thing to look for if you want to know if they're a harlequin or not, is whether they have these really distinctive white cheeks. They're not really cheeks at all because they are white patches on their side of their pronotum and the pronotum is the hard protective plate that covers the soft thorax and the head when it's tucked in. There are other black ladybirds that aren't harlequins, but of all of the black ladybirds, only the black harlequins have the round cheeks. And this is really useful when you're looking at photographs them, of them to identify, identify them, is to see whether they have these white cheeks. Size is really important. The seven spot ladybirds shown here are five to eight millimeters long, the same size as a harlequin, whereas the 16 spot is only ever about three millimeters. This is a good example of the importance of size. Can you tell which of these two is the harlequin? The harlequin is the one on the left. Although these two initially appear very similar, the pine ladybird on the right is only ever about three to four and a half millimeters long, whereas the harlequin on the left is nearly twice the size, about five to eight millimeters long. That's the difference between a single grain of pearl barley and a good plump garden pea cut in half. When looking at photos, you can tell how big something is. And this is when the white cheeks are so helpful. So if you see a photograph of a black ladybird, look for these white cheeks. And if you see these round white cheeks, then it's a harlequin. 
The aim of the book is to help you identify all the conspicuous ladybirds of Britain and Ireland. And therefore there's an additional section at the back with photographs and descriptions of all 26 species. The more I have learned about ladybirds, the more I am in awe of both their diversity and their beauty. And I hope you agree that ladybirds really are an amazing species of beetle. Thank you. That's given you a taste of what you might enjoy about the book. It's been a privilege and a joy learning about them and writing this book. And I hope I can now pass some of that on to others. Thank you very much, Helen. So firstly, what made you realize that this book was necessary? Well, when I was starting to learn more about ladybirds, I soon discovered that although there are some really good resources available on the native ladybirds, and there are, there are some really good books, um, there wasn't and there isn't that much out there on harlequins. I really struggled to find out about them, specifically how to identify them. And I looked for a handy book that would give me lots of helpful information and instructive photographs, but no such book existed. So the more I learned and struggled to learn about them, the more it started to dawn on me that there really was a need for a book about Harlequins. And I showed Helen Roy, who's the organizer alongside Peter Brown um, of the UK Ladybird Survey, an early draft of my book, uh, which had a working title of how to identify Harlequin ladybirds. And she was really delighted that at last there would be a book out there about Harlequins. And she encouraged me to get it published. Uh, the book then evolved and grew into a full field guide. Basically, I've written the book that I wish had been available when I was learning about Harlequins. Great. And in terms of resources, what did you use to write the book? And was there anything in your research that shocked or surprised you? The main resource was the ladybirds themselves. Um, I spent hours out and about photographing, studying and learning as much as possibly, possibly I could. Um, I tried to read as much as I could about them as well. But again, I struggled to find out information on the Harlequin. In the end, I found that scholarly articles and academic papers were the best um, source of information, particularly from other countries. There is a lot out there. Um, and it was just so interesting to read all about the various studies that have been undertaken. I also devised, um, as I said, a key for the book that will help you to identify whether or not a ladybird is a Harlequin. And did anything shock or surprise me? Yes, the number of photographs online that are wrongly identified and incorrectly named. For example, Pine Ladybird, about 15% of the images were in fact Harlequins. And that makes it really confusing when you're trying to learn. Right. Um, the book has over 350 incredible colour photographs, each taken by you, Helen. I think a lot of naturalists, as well as nature photographers, would be really interested in knowing what kind of camera and lenses that you use. Thanks, Moira. I'm very fortunate. I have a really good SLR camera and a good macro lens, and I never use them. I haven't used them for quite a few years now. All I use is my iPhone. Um, I use, in addition, that's not true, in addition, I use one of these, and it's a little rubber band with a small plastic um, macro lens in it, and you just slip it over the end of the phone, and it's $4.99 on eBay. <laughs> Great. Um, are there any particular ladybirds that we need to report if we see them, and if so, where should we report them to? Yeah, good question. At the moment, there aren't any specific ladybirds that we need to report. Um, however, the UK Ladybird Survey and iRecord would love to hear from anyone who sees any ladybirds. Um, the UK Ladybird Survey receives about 25,000 records a year by thousands of recorders. And some recorders only um, will only have seen one ladybird and other recorders will have seen loads of ladybirds, but they're always interested in 
all ladybird sightings. They were set up primarily back in 2004 to monitor the spread of the harlequin ladybird. Um, and they calculated that in the first four years in Britain, harlequins spread north at a rate of 100 kilometers a year. I mean, that's astounding. Their records show that there's been declines in the distribution of seven native species of ladybird since the arrival of the harlequin, most notably the two-spot ladybird, which has decreased by 43%. So yeah, please report um, any ladybirds you see to either iRecord or UK Ladybird Survey. You just go online, put in iRecord or UK Ladybird Survey, and there's a form there that you can fill in. They'd like to have a photograph, ideally. They would like to know the date, um, the location, and what you saw. So yeah, it's always worth reporting or anything you see. Okay, brilliant. Um, and finally, you've spoken about your dining table being taken over by containers of ladybirds. What would you say has been the hardest part about breeding them? I, I think just how much time it takes up. They can be incredibly time consuming. OK, if perhaps I'd only bred one or two ladybirds, it wouldn't be so time consuming. But you saw how many homes were on my dining room tables and it really did become very time consuming. There's the cleaning them out usually every day, depending on what cycle they're at and what stage they're at and which species they are, um, feeding them. I had no idea that when I started breeding ladybirds, I'd also have to start becoming a aphid breeder, an aphid farmer. That wasn't something I was expecting. So my neighbours got used to me going out and scouring the rose bushes, their road, rose bushes, with a little pot and a paintbrush and scraping off the aphids. I would then have to have an aphid colony on its own so that they would be breeding because a, um, a healthy larva or adult ladybird can eat up to 70 aphids a day. So that was quite a challenge to keep them well fed. Um, when I went to change them, some of the ladybirds, they just wanted to do a Houdini. They just wanted to fly away. So every time I changed them, that was quite challenging, taking them out, taking out the leaves and putting in fresh whatever was needed. Um, the Bryony ladybirds, however, they were an absolute joy. They are, and that was another thing, discovering how each species seemed to have a different personality for want of a better description. And some were very, very timid. Some dropped to the ground as soon as I approached them. Whereas the briony ladybirds, they were so chilled. They were totally unfussed as long as they only eat white briony plants and flowers and leaves. So as long as they had things to eat, they didn't seem fussed. I could come along, take them out and they were just completely chilled, which was lovely. Um, but they ate an enormous amount every day. I'd have to go out, find some white bryony plants, come back, put them in their clean home, put the bryony ladybirds back. And then the next morning I'd lift the lid and it would just be like looking at skeletal leaves and what goes in has to come out. So there was an awful lot of ladybird poo. And it, honestly, it was a struggle just to keep on top of, top of it. I didn't mean to breed the uh, briony ladybirds. They were a accident. Uh, the briony ladybird arrived in England in the 90s. And unlike the invasive harlequin, they are very slow to spread and they only eat white briony plants. So there's no problem with them either. So they started spreading out from London to Surrey and they are making a very slow spread outwards. So. I decided I wanted to see them. So I drove the hour and a half to the nearest place where I thought I could find them. And to my absolute joy, I found them and I was photographing them. And then I came across a pair of mating um, ladybirds, but they were in a really awkward place. And when I photograph my ladybirds, I try not to disturb them. I try to just photograph them as they are and then leave them be. But these ones were really awkward. So I thought just these, this ones, I'm going to pick the leaf very carefully. So I picked the leaf and I photographed with my phone. I was photographing them. And then when I finished, I very carefully put the mating pair of ladybirds back on a fresh leaf. And then I just happened to turn the leaf over 
and under the leaf, there were some eggs. Well, I knew that if I left the leaf there within a day, it would have shriveled up and the eggs wouldn't survive. So I had no choice but to bring them home with me, rear the ladybirds, and then five weeks later, take nine bryony adults, an hour and a half's drive, all the way back to put them exactly where I'd found them. So that was an unexpected joy, but it was really good and I loved having them. Uh, what else? Oh, some of the intimate details I discovered, that was amazing. Eggs, for example. There isn't actually that much information out there on ladybird eggs and the differences between ladybird eggs. It, you read that most ladybird eggs, as indeed they are, are yellowy and ovoid, and they are laid either upright or upright or hanging down. And apart from the pine ladybird, which can lay them on the side. But the cream spot ladybird that I was breeding from, when they laid their eggs, I was absolutely amazed. They have two red dots on the side of the egg shell. It's not an internal thing, it's an external thing that look just like eyes. So all the eggs are laid side by side with these two red dots looking for all the world like eyes. And that was amazing. Uh, the joy and the privilege somehow of watching, you have the adult ladybirds, you, you know that they're mating, then they lay the eggs and then you watch the eggs hatch and these tiny little larva come out. And for the predatory ones, it's the anxiety, will they manage to catch an aphid in time? And for the first day or so, they, they weren't really eating anything. And I was like, no, I'm doing something wrong. And then they start to become interested in what is to them, huge aphids, you know, larger than them. And then the kind of the feeling of triumph when you watch this aphid, um, this larva catch its first aphid. So it's, that was really unexpected how I suppose, how engrossed I got in them. And then just the joy of successfully breeding them to adulthood and then releasing them out in the wild. Uh, what else? Well, there were some unexpected things like I discovered that in the wild, every now and then I would come across a pupa that had that they are fixed to leaves when when they first start to pupate, they fix themselves to the leaves by their anal pads. So they are fixed to the leaf, but occasionally, for whatever reason, they fall off the leaf. And if the pupa, if the adult starts to emerge from the pupal case and it's not attached to anything, it can't sort of walk away from its case. So I've come across ladybirds in the wild where the adult ladybird hasn't been able to emerge and it's just got its head out and it's stuck in its pupal case and it will die. So I discovered that when this happened, if I brought them home and I put an absolutely tiny square of double-sided sellotape on the bottom of the pupa, and then I fixed that to a piece of cardboard or something or wood or even perspex, fixed it to that. When they emerge, they've then got something that they can walk away from and they survive. So I was doing things like that as well. But really, it was just the joy of being able to learn and study them in intimate detail. And when, for example, the pupa that was on the leaf, it is metamorphosizing equivalent of the same as a caterpillar turns into a butterfly. So inside their pupa, all the larval uh, parts of them are mushing down and reforming into the adult, the mouth parts and all the bits of an adult. So effectively, they're a kind of soup inside their pupa. And yet, even when they are in this soupy state of an unformed being, if a little fly or wasp, which could be a, paras a parasitic one and therefore be a problem to them, if that comes up and approaches them and they feel it approach them, they are still able to flick up in the hope that they will frighten away the fly or the wasp. So even in that soup state, the pupil case, the pupa is still able to flick up. I just find those kind of tiny details absolutely fascinating. So it was, it was a brilliant, brilliant thing to do. And I learned so much. Wow, that's great. Thank you, Helen. Um, that concludes this book launch. A Field Guide to Harlequins and Other Common Ladybirds of Britain and Ireland is out now. 
and details of how to order the book are listed on the event page and video description. Thank you very much again, Helen. It's a pleasure.